for sure. We've got uh, great, professional, close, um, really productive working relationships um, built upon many years of experience dealing with a really broad range um, of incidents uh, and emergencies um, throughout the county. Uh, these include uh, safe recovery and disposal of uh, found munitions, uh, significant water outages, um, many of the aspects of uh, COVID-19 as we've gone th through the, the past um, 18 months, probably a bit longer, um, in relation to enforcement, testing, um, outbreak management, uh, and of course the vaccination programme as well. Uh, we also regularly come together as partners to test our whole system re uh, response to such incidents and uh, do uh, tabletop exercises. Um, a train crash will be a, a typical example of that uh, to make sure that we are, are prepared and ready uh, for whatever challenges may come our way. Um, essentially, there are two phases to the work of any TCG. The first being emergency preparedness uh, and the second being um, emergency response and recovery. Uh, these two phases are uh, always really cyclical. And today's, or the suggestion for today's briefing arose um, from the response and recovery phase of the um, floods in February 2000, uh, sorry, 2020, um, just before obviously the impact of COVID uh, began to uh, reach us all. Um, the response and recovery phase of that identified that there were opportunities uh, to improve or do more with our communities to increase preparedness for future um, flooding events. Uh, now, the, the topic of flooding, despite it being a, a beautiful evening here in Herefordshire, um, is really topical at the moment, um, given the prominence in uh, news broadcasts um, in relation to climate change uh, and uh, extreme weather events uh, across the world, really. Um, but we do have, um, and it's easy in those circumstances, isn't it, to think that um, you know this might be something that impacts uh, elsewhere, and we have to make a full assessment as to what the reality of that um, is for us here in Herefordshire. Uh, we do know that uh, here in Herefordshire we have regular and repeat repeated flooding events, uh, which have had an undoubted disruptive impact on our local communities. Uh, so, with that in mind, we've um, brought together this evening. Uh, three speakers to uh, brief and talk to us all um, and to um, encourage some conversation, some thought and some action as to what we can all do to support our communities in, in uh, being as prepared as we possibly can for the undoubted um, next flooding events that we will experience. Uh, the first speaker this evening is Jason Walker from the Environment Agency, who's going to brief us on um, the, the differences between the Environment Agency and Met Office Alert Systems. As I'm aware, that can sometimes cause a little bit of um, concern and confusion, so it's really important that we uh, understand that uh, as best we can. Uh, Jason will also uh, describe to us how we uh, predict and model the impact of uh, anticipated flooding events uh, and advise us on what we should do when we're on receipt of a um, flood alert or a warning and what the difference is between the two of those. Uh, our second speaker this evening is Group Commander Gareth Clark from Herefordshire, uh, Hereford and Worcester Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, he's going to give us uh, all some advice um, and considerations for flood preparation, uh, prevention and protection, um, some individual advice on the hazards of flood water um, and some guidance on salvage and restoration uh, post flooding incidents. Uh, and our third and final speaker for this evening is Steve Hodges from Herefordshire Council. Uh, who's going to uh, direct and guide us to communication channels in terms of preparing for floods uh, and the event of a flood occurring here in the county. And it'll also touch upon Herefordshire Council's response to flooding uh, and property flood resilience. Um, I hope there'll be some questions as we go along. Um, I would ask that um, we uh, bring together um, the questions at the close of each individual speaker's section. Um, so there will be opportunity um, after each speaker to um, put forward some questions. There's also the facility um, here on Teams to put them into the chat as well. So I'd encourage and urge people um, to use that facility if you could, please. Uh, and then finally, just before I hand over to, to Jason for his opening presentation, um, just to make everybody aware that we are recording tonight's uh, presentation. 
uh, which hopefully be really beneficial in making it available to as many of our colleagues, uh, partners and communities as possible. So that's my introduction. I'll now hand over to Jason from the Environment Agency. Yeah, hi Ross. Hi everyone. Thanks very much um, for that introduction. That's great. Um, I, I'm a, my name is Jason Walker. I work for the Environment Agency, as, as Ross already said there. Uh, I've been at the EA for 10 years. Um, substantively, I'm a, an engagement advisor, but I'm a, also a flood warning duty officer when we go into incident mode. So those alerts and warnings that we're going to talk about tonight, sometimes they are actually sent by me to your phones, probably uh, to, to mixed to mixed reactions at times. <laughs> I, I just briefly want to take you through uh, how we make those decisions around the flood warning service, uh, what the flood warning codes mean, um, and hopefully, you know, just talk about some of the confusion we sometimes see with regard to the Met Office and our uh, systems as well. And I'm going to try and summarise that in sort of about five or six minutes, which is um, no mean feat. So you can move me on if you like, Pete. Thank you very much. OK, so the, the slide on the on the screen there just shows uh, some of the tools that we have internally, and it is only some of the tools that we have internally for making the decision based uh, that, that we base the decision to, to issue a flood alert or a flood warning um, on. Um, I'll take you through them quite briefly. The one on the top left um, is a tool that we get from the Met Office, and that goes to our flood forecasting centre. So our modelling officers and our, our duty forecasters who, who kind of sit above me in the structure as, as a warner, um, they'll look at that data from the Met Office and they break that down into a risk matrix essentially. So there's a grid across the across the country and that will give us a, a risk of how likely uh, impacts are and how significant those impacts are. We use that to sort of plan five days in ahead at all times. That report comes to us every single day and, and, and that's just a brief overview of that. Um, in the, in the centre of the uh, of the you can see like a green box with with various boxes in it as well, and that's an internal tool that we use. We've we've devised ourselves for our rapid response catchments. Now, Herefordshire doesn't strictly have any defined rapid response catchments, but it does have some what we call flashy catchments that don't quite meet the criteria. And um, we know where those those places are in Herefordshire, uh, Peter Peter Church, and places like that where rapid flooding, rapid onset flooding has occurred, and and those places are sort of taken into account with that decision making process that we've got there as well and there are specific actions that we have with this TCG group when we know that those conditions might cause problems in those places. Um, in the top right we've got uh, a, a, just a selection of our radar and the, the one in the middle there is, is high rad that we use mainly and, and we use that for timing of events. Um, especially if we're sitting up all night in the incident room waiting for, a, you know, an Atlantic storm to come across or, or a particularly heavy front to come across, we, we can we can time things using the right radar and therefore we can give proper lead times for when we issue alerts and when we issue warnings and that hopefully is beneficial to you. We try and give at least two hours for warnings, um, but if we've got more than that, then we will give it if we're sure. Um, but with alerts we can give a lot more a lot, a lot more time with that a lot more advanced warning um on the left hand side that, that map with all the fancy colors on it that's soil moisture deficit map so what we look at there or more specifically our modeling and forecasting officers look at is how much room essentially there is in the soil for water or for moisture um, the lighter colours, the blues, the greens, that's where there is a lot of capacity. And then you've got the reds and the purples where there's not a lot of capacity. So we can make a judgment call there on how quickly that's going to fill up. Therefore, how quickly the rivers are going to respond. If we've got a, a fully red map, as we sometimes do in the winter, we know that rivers are going to rise quicker. Um, obviously, there's, a, there's another end of that spectrum now in the summer where the ground is hard and we can get rapid runoff. Uh, and that can cause its own problems. But th there's kind of a bell curve with soil moisture deficit, but we can, we can use that and we can analyze that. And there's, kind of, there's, there's also a picture in the bottom right hand corner, which is a little bit hidden there, but essentially that's our, our new tool for, uh, it's kind of a one, one place fits all for our uh, hydrographs, our rainfall data and all of our different models. So once we go into incident mode or once we're, we're, we're looking at the rivers for, for potential flood impacts, we can click on any gauge on that service and we can look at what the models are saying is likely to happen considering the rainfall that is forecast. That, that's quite an important point as well, that it's about the rainfall that's forecast. And, and if you put rubbish in, you get rubbish out. So sometimes if the forecast's a bit wrong, sometimes it's a little bit wrong. Um, 
and that that can happen that's the nature of forecasting uh, and we we do our best with the data that we get from the met office and then how we interpret that i mean the, the thing to really take from this the, the important thing is that the flood alert or the flood warning that we issue is is the end of the chain it's it's not the first thought in our minds it's it's after we've done all of that analysis that we decide to, to issue a flood alert or a warning pete if you want to go to the next slide please that's great so here we have the flood warning service codes now this is always a bone of contention internally as well to be honest and when we talk to the public it's always the thing that usually comes up as a, as a point of confusion so the flood alert that's the lowest level alert that we send out sometimes you'll see that quoted in the media as as a yellow or an orange and and that's kind of where it gets a bit confusing and the, similarly with the flood warning i've seen local media outlets quote the environment agency have issued a red flood warning um if you see that please try and discourage it because it just leads to confusion with something that we'll, we'll talk about in a, in a minute so essentially the flood alert is a be prepared a warning for you to have a look at what's going on is is the situation going to get worse but really we use it for low level flooding for agricultural land for low lying roads for uh, footpaths next to watercourses it's all of that regular winter flooding land that we always know floods the the messaging on on the actual message that you get sometimes it's kind of a little bit alarmist it, it says things like be prepared, be prepared to act, you know, prepare a flood kit of essential items. If you regularly receive a flood alert, then you know what that flood alert means. And that's that's kind of what we want to encourage really is, is for people to know what that flood alert means. If it's getting worse, if you know that the weather is going to continue to get worse and therefore progress to a flood warning, then yeah, maybe you do want to start thinking on alert that you might want to think about what, what you're going to put together in case you have to leave your house or, you know, move in possessions. But at flood alert level, basically, it's a watch and brief, be alert. Um, the flood warning is the next code up. We usually issue the flood warning, and this is pretty much, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, we issue the flood warning where we expect the first property to flood. Causes a little bit of confusion in certain places. If we take the estuary, for an example, um, the threshold for the flood warning being issued is the top of the seawall. So as soon as that seawall is lipped over, the flood warning would go out. Well, if you're half a mile away from that seawall, the likelihood is if that water is only just lapping over the edge, you're not impacted, but you're still going to get that flood warning. So again, the thing we want to encourage is for people to be aware of their threshold. Um, we're a way off yet, but what we want to do eventually with the flood warning service is be able to have customers sign up for a threshold level on a gauge that's relevant to them just for a warning to come through at a level that is relevant to them. That's not to say, you know, it's just when your property would flood, but whatever is of interest to you, say when a piece of infrastructure goes under or a road goes under or whatever, you would be able to set your own warning level or, or you could just have the default. But that's what we want to do in the future. It's probably a couple of years off yet, but that's that's what we'd really like to do with the service. And we'd also like to, to, to connect them up to Google Maps and to push them out to you automatically via your phone, which is something that we're trying to work on with google and uh, and with our future technology so hopefully that's that's in the pipeline i mean the severe is the next one up now if you get a severe warning don't hesitate if it's safe to do so get out of your house that is the, the essentially what a severe flood warning is saying it's it's call 999 if you're in immediate danger and one of my colleagues here will, will probably come and help you it's um it's not a decision that we take lightly and there isn't a set threshold on any flood warning area for severe it's uh, a decision made by that tactical coordination group that ccg group that ross was talking about before uh, it's based on resources it's based on uh, impacts it's based on what we think is it is it actually a danger to life we've issued severe warnings based on high tides before to keep people away um, we've also issued severe warnings in places like Bugley where barriers have overtopped and where we know that there's going to be a catastrophic impact on a, on a very quick basis. Um, there's been severes all, all, all over the country in, in the last 12 months, uh, probably at an unprecedented level. So I think the one thing to take from that is that, and I'm sure Gareth will talk about this in, in a while, is that in your own house, you have a plan if your house is on fire. I, I think if you know your house floods or if it is at risk of flooding, that, that plan for what you would do in that scenario is essential uh, and and I would massively 
encourage you to do that if you know that your house floods. But if, if there are any confusion with any of those things, then I'm, I'm more than happy to field the, the questions. I know it is not an easy um, system to interpret. It's not as easy as the Met Office is, for example. Just push it on, please, Pete. That'd be great. So there's just some contact details there. If you want to register for the uh, flood warning service, obviously it's free. We'll only keep your data on, on record for the purposes of the flood warning service. You can call Floodline, which is 0345 988 You can go to the gov.uk website, which is signed up for flood warnings, um, or you can just email our team. That's our local team email address, that flood resilience at environment agency.gov.uk. So somebody in our team in Tewkesbury well, although we're mostly home based at the moment, somebody in our team at Gene Tewkesbury will, will field that inquiry. Go to the next slide, please, Pete. So this, this is my, my last slide, and it's, it's just something I wanted to highlight, um, the difference between the Met Office warnings and, and our EA um, flood warning service warnings. And it's because it's something that comes up regularly when we meet the public. Um, again, touching on that thing where we say, oh, it's a red or it's an amber or it's a green or it's a yellow, and, and, and these color codes come out all the time if you ever hear anything color coded it's not environment agency it's an alert it's a warning or it's a severe warning and that's the only terminology we use we used to use amber and red and we used to use flood watch and flood warning and that's all gone now and it's a long time ago so it's alert or warning or severe the met office use amber or yellow or red and if you look at the the, the graphic on the left hand side they're really useful. The Met Office, the Met Office system is really, really useful. Um, it's it's color coded. It's easy to interpret. It, it's easy when it's a thing like a thunderstorm or extreme heat or extreme of temperature. It's, it's really useful for a general picture for, for an area of the country to say this might happen in this area. If you look at the graphic on the right hand side, that just shows one of our flood warning areas, which just shows the Yazer Brook, Yazer and Wide Marsh Brook, actually just north of Hereford City itself. So our flood warnings are very community focused. They're usually watercourse focused. We know we know that the conditions in that in that warning polygon are as they are when when we issue that warning, as opposed to like I say the the, the Met Office service where they say extreme heat or, or hailstones or whatever it is in this in this large polygon. Um, what we're trying to do is be very very specific when we get down to warnings. So you know, hopefully they're a little bit more targeted. We don't always get it right. Um, but hopefully what I've said at least gives you the confidence that we carefully consider those alerts and warnings um, before we issue them and, and, and just know that we always usually are on the side of caution. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions here. And if you're not happy to ask me here, then feel free to email me on the Flood Resilience email and, and I'm happy to talk to you whenever. And that's me, Pete. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. I've, uh, I've got a couple of questions which I've picked up from the chat, which I'll um, put to you now, if I may. So the first one's from Councillor uh, Swinglehurst from Langaran, I believe. Um, his question, does the soil mo moisture deficit map take account for land use and the loss of organic matter? So does the uh, how regularly is the understanding of the uh, land's ability to cope factored into this mapping? Yeah, it's it, it's not to be honest. That the, um, the interaction of the two systems isn't isn't something that we've got the capability for at the moment. All we can do in those scenarios is know where those problem fields are, um, and we've got a whole environment management team in the background who will know where those problem fields are. Um, we've got a soil reporter tool. We've got use of satellite imagery, um, and. And yeah, that's usually just on local knowledge, but unfortunately it doesn't take into account the individual sort of field um, conditions. It would be wonderful if it, if it could have that capability, but obviously with the change in crop rotation and things, it would, might be a little bit too complicated at this stage, but I would love it if it did. Yeah, there was a second question there. Thanks, Jason, from Councillor Jim Moon. I think you've covered off in the same point, which was uh, does the, the mapping change each year or even during the year? Uh, due to nature of crops and so on and so forth. So thank you, Jason. I think that's all the questions I've had in the chat. Uh, does anyone else want to raise any uh, questions of Jason before we go to our next speaker, please? I've got two. Uh, Jenny Gowan, would you like to go first, please? 
Yes, thank you. Um, does your alert system relate only to what happens in main rivers, or does it take account of what happens in what's classified as ordinary watercourses? Uh, to put it into context, um, I'm from Wellington, and we have Wellington Brook, which is a tributary of the Lug, and has a propensity to a flash flood, basically. Um, so I was wondering whether you you mentioned Jaser Brook earlier, and I wondered whether or not our brook would constitute as being something you would be able to alert us of. Yeah. So usually, our our statutory requirement is for main rivers, um, mm -hmm. and it and it is just for for, for rivers for for alerts and warnings, um, and for those main rivers, there are various other systems that we can use. Um, there are community based systems that are fundable and they're not ridiculously expensive that can provide automatic alerts. Uh, so they don't come into the environment agency system, but they provide basically a, a very similar service. Right. Um, the, the other thing is that when we issue an alert, some of them will say sort of things like brooks, ri rivers and brooks in sort of South Worcestershire or ri rivers in North Herefordshire. If we issue an alert like that, then then we're kind of expecting those ordinary watercourses also to be, you know, high or, or in or in flood. So it's it's worth signing up for the alerts um, any, anyway, because the, the, those low level alerts will cover that sort of generic lower level normal winter uh, flood type event. Um, but yeah, there are there are some community based systems that we've employed in various places and that they they're on an automatic, they're an automatic system. So there's a logger, and as soon as that logger is touched by the water, it pings out a text message. They're about seven thousand pounds, something like that. And then there's a there's an ongoing maintenance cost, but that's that's not an EA thing. They're a they're a community based um, system. And there's also a there's a there's a camera based system that does the same thing as well. It fires a radar at the at the water, and as soon as the water rises up to a certain level, it will automatically send you a text message. And we can word that with any community group. They can, you can choose the wording; it doesn't matter. It can, it can say whatever, it, whatever, it, whatever you like it to. So Brilliant. there are options. There are options. Can, there. Yeah, can I get information on that? Commun those community-based systems from you if I contact you after the meeting? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, just yeah. drop me an email. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, Jim Moore, would you like to go next, please? Um, it, it's really following on from the brook conversation. Um, we live in the. Garan and Gamba catchment area um, and Langaran and Lanwarn parishes are subject to quite severe flash floods. And it really is to ask, really following on, we have a problem when the ground is saturated and then there follows a storm. Yeah. And we've probably then got two hours to warn people of immediate flood risk. And to give you some example, I have a field here, which is a floodplain, and it went from nothing to two feet deep in two hours. Yeah. And it is how do we warn people of that immediacy? Um, the other point was just to say that when I tried to sign up to the uh, flood alert, I was told I couldn't, or the computer said no, because I wasn't in a property that was um, of a flood risk. Yeah. So it would be kind of useful if we're going to have a local parish alert system to be able to do that. I'm assuming if I email you, I can. Yeah, if, and, and if you email me, to be honest, the system should allow you to sign up even if you're not in a flood warning area, in, in an area that's at risk of flood. It, it should let you sign up anyway, because if you had like a second home, for instance, that was in a flood warning, you should still be able to sign up with your primary address. How I wish. I know. I, I Well, yeah, same. But I always get a bit lost in the system there as well. And and But just drop us an email. Um, I will. And, but and it, 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 it's the immediate... Uh, it, you know, we all talk about brooks and rather than main rivers, but you know, six to eight houses are threatened by flooding in a very quick time. Um, how do we warn them? There, with the community gauges that I was just talking about before in the yeah. question, um, there are a couple of different options that you've got there. That there are rainfall gauges as well that can send out automatic messages. Um, those rainfall gauges can be based on either total, so you can have a rainfall total alarm. So if it gets to sort of 10 mil then it will send you an alert or you can have it set to intensity so if you know or you know working with us if, if we could work out what sort yeah. of 
the that rainfall event causes you a problem, we can then send an alert based on that intensity of rainfall. The thing is, that's a bit experimental. So you might get a few, you know, false alarms, but they they do work. Um, and it might give you a little bit more advanced warning. So yeah, you know, I, 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 40, I, 40 minutes I, I, yeah, thank you. And I think we're at a point now where in 1920, we had two floods. Last winter, we had six. Now, only one of those ended up with flooded houses, but the problem isn't going away. It's just getting worse. Yeah, and I mean, I know it's this sounds really, really obvious, and I don't want to tell you how to suck eggs here, but it's just having those local triggers that when you know the brook gets to a certain height, if it's still raining, this is going to happen. And no. I, don't, I don't for one minute want to send you out there to look. That, that's the other <laughs> thing as well. So uh, maybe a camera-based system would, would be quite good then, because there is that option too. We will be in touch. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stark, good evening. If you'd like to go ahead, please. Councillor Stark, can you hear us? I'm not sure if you're frozen. I think Councillor Stark uh, may have frozen. Yeah, thanks, Pete. That's unfortunate. Hopefully, you'll be able to join us shortly, and I'll, I'll give him the opportunity to raise that, that question at the end. Uh, if that's all the questions on presentation number one, I'll move us on to presentation two and introduce uh, Group Commander Gareth Clark from uh, Fire and Rescue Service. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ross. Much appreciated. And uh, thanks for having me here. Um, yeah, so Gareth Clark, I um, I look after the operational fire and rescue crews within Herefordshire. Um, I've uh, got experience of floods, having been in the fire and rescue service since uh, 1997 across um, Shropshire, Worcestershire and Herefordshire. Um, and some of that includes uh, the legendary 2007 floods, but also I went down to Surrey for the wide area floods in 2014 as well. So I've seen some quite large scale as well as some of the local things that we're talking about this evening. So um, if we just move on, Pete. And again. Yeah, so building on, on really what Jason's just been talking about um, from the EA is, is really just to emphasise that point. Please do subscribe where you can to these uh, for these uh, range of services. So uh, Jason touched on the fact that the Met Office offers something, but also um, that the, the flood alert and flood warning system that the EA provide is, is quite a, a simple and well put together approach. And actually, I've got to uh, endorse that as he's, uh, as he's just been speaking about it. And uh, I'd like to support that. So uh, the first thing really please is do subscribe to these services. They are available to you. And as technology has moved on, they're getting better and better. So. Um, when you are notified um, of alerts, in the way that Jason said, you, you can judge the seriousness based upon uh, the level which comes through. And Jason's been through that, so I won't go over that any, uh, anymore. But there's also social media available to you, um, whether that be via people like the EA, the Met Office, um, the Flood Advisory Service. Um, it could be through the police, could be through ourselves um, or, or through Herefordshire Council. There's a range of different sources of information which are fairly well kept up to date by people. And it's amazing how much up-to-date information, incident information, um, the emergency services can get actually through just normal social media accounts, just things like Twitter and Facebook as to what's going on. Um, there's also, of course, uh, your groups, um, your um, uh, means of communicating with each other and with your communities uh, that you can use. Um, also, uh, listen to listening to mainstream uh, media and keep an, an eye on public announcements as well. OK, uh, next one, please, Pete. So I thought I'd just give you some, some information about Herefordshire over the last three years relating to um, some of the incidents we attend. So rescues and evacuation from water incidents, um, been, there's been 171 of them. And of that, a very large proportion of them are involving vehicles. Flooding, specifically flooding incidents, been 266 in Herefordshire over the last three years. Um, and actually involving vehicles, that's 41. Um, and there have been 71 of those incidents where we've actually had to evacuate people, whether that be from cars, um, you know, stranded vehicles, whether it be from houses or, or other locations. Um, and that is just Herefordshire. And I appreciate we're Herefordshire and, uh, Hereford and Worcester Fire and Rescue Service, but um, I have just um, isolated the Herefordshire figures there. Um, and, and a large proportion of those, um, I'll be honest, are from last year. 
Um, okay, thanks, Pete. So we asked you to consider, consider ways um, how to prevent uh, the flooding from, from causing um, you know, the most danger, the most damage. So if you know where the water flows, um, and, and let's not just assume it's these low-lying areas of brooks and things like that. I mean, in the past, I've seen you know, the likes of rivers flowing down the side of pretty high up hills, actually, and then through people's houses and pubs and things like that. And actually, it's happened year on year or season on season. So if you know certain areas where it comes through, those are the areas where to build the walls or build up banks or use sandbags, um, assuming they're available. Um, keeping ditches, culverts, and grips clear. I know parish councils have a certain um, ability to, to do that and certainly to influence that. Um, and we do try and encourage really, um, try and encourage a balance between whatever your expectation of us as the emergency services are um, and your reliance on us and, and your actually your ability to, to kind of keep yourselves fairly resilient for, for some time as well. So knowing where sandbags are, how to access them. Um, we will and we have done uh, help and assist with um, installing and uh, putting up flood defences and moving sandbags and things like that around. But our, our priority, as to be said, is always going to be about savable life. Um, we do do pumping. We can do that. Um, as, which I, I hope wouldn't surprise anybody here. Um, but really, if the priority, we will always direct our resources, our priority um, to where there is our lives at risk. And unfortunately, almost every time there, there, there are, um, which I'll cover more, more about why that is uh, shortly. Um, we, don't, we don't have an unlimited amount of specialist resources. It may surprise uh, many of you to find out that actually, although we have rescue plastered all over the sides of our vehicles and our organisation, our badges, uh, water rescue is actually not something we're statutorily obliged to um, provide, water rescue. Uh, we do, and we have done for many years. But for example, Herefordshire only has one boat. We do have, um, uh, you know, colleagues in our neighbouring areas, and certainly Hereford Worcester has more boats. But, but I'm just saying in Herefordshire alone, we only have one. So you can imagine um, that that as a specialist resource or specialist teams will be directed to where it's needed most. That's not to say we don't have capability across um, Herefordshire. Of, we do have many teams that are what we call water first responder trained, and they have gear and equipment and ability to go into water. Um, but, but, but again, they're specialist resources. It's not every single fire station, every single appliance. Um, and we will have to prioritise where we send that. So we, again, we're encouraging community and personal resilience as well. So we encourage the resilience within your parish council networks, but also uh, the individuals um, within your parishes as well, and, we, and we'd like you to, you know, to do the same if you can, please. Uh, Pete, next slide, slide, please. So, if you've had the um, the alerts or the warnings, and you've got to the stage where you think this is serious enough to warrant doing something, um, this be uh, perhaps on an individual level. Now, we do advise, um, and I know you're going to get a bit more detail shortly as well from um, from Steve the installation of property flood resilience, so PFR measures. And that'll be things like door and air brick guards. So there's an example of a door guard there on the picture on the left there, a very simple system which slides into place and actually can save an awful lot of damage uh, to property. Air brick guards, similar thing. Um, you, you simply patch up, you know, they could be self-closing ones, but they'll, they'll actually patch up the air brick so that water can't come through. Consider isolating power and utilities if, if it's at risk from flood water and not missing simple things like um, actually have we got trailing leads, you know, four gang sockets trailing on the floors and things like that. Lift them up, unplug them, completely remove them, that sort of thing, because they can provide further hazard for you. Or even start fire, believe it or not, within your house that's almost underwater. Um, so primarily rural area we do um, advise people to move and feed animals or livestock if they're likely to become stranded or if they're likely to be stuck in an area where they can't get uh, to food over a period of days for example um, and we do um, really implore people to, uh, to really take heed of certainly those um, severe warnings that Jason was talking about to actually evacuate before the loss of access and egress. I can think of one person within our service area who who likes to quite regularly make sure, wait until his um, his house is completely surrounded and it, it becomes like an island, and then ask us to transport things like petrol and fuel to him, things like that. And and this is exactly what we're trying to get across to people: is you can do that in advance. Um, we do suggest 
putting together a flood plan, as Jason mentioned, actually, in case you become marooned. And it's simple things like, like putting together a grab bag, any documents you might need, medication, battery power banks, torches, doing the salvage before the damage happens. So what, rather than raising stuff up out of the water so that it can dry out, raising things up um, above the, the level the water can get to before it happens. Um, we do advise safe lighting. We really are never going to promote candles in the fire and rescue service. Um, and we do suggest having one plug-in phone if you've, if you've got uh, technology that old, quite hard to come by these days. Um, nutritious food, if you can, uh, that can be eaten cold, um, but long life milk. And of course, toilet paper and sanitary products. Um, I was going to say it's a good thing uh, the the COVID pandemic hit after the flooding had subsided in our two counties because I don't think you've been able to get any toilet paper. <laughs> um, be, next slide. Uh, okay, so flood water. Um, I, I I often say about flood water. Really, that this this is something you could you could quite literally talk about for days because there's many many different hazards within flood water, and I've only got a couple of minutes. So, just to point out a couple of things which may or may not be obvious to you. Um, <clears throat> flood water tends to be this sort of dark brown colour that you see in the photo in the middle on the right hand side. You can't see what's in it, you can't see what's underneath it. It may be full of things like uh, barbed wire or razor wire or pig wire, fences and things which have been washed washed away in a hurry as the as sort of roads become rivers and all that sort of thing. Um, or you could have um, areas with this sort of intriguing looking bubbling effect like you can see in the photo at the top left there. That usually means that a manhole cover or uh, inspection chamber is lifted uh, with the pressure of the water in the system. And that means that's just pockets of air bubbles trying to escape from the system, but, but that water will be um, you know, firing through that system at some rate. And of course, it'll be loaded with sewage as well. Um, <clears throat> incidentally, flood water, usually you might as well just think of it as being sewage water, it's very highly contaminated with all sorts of anything it's passed through, quite frankly. And certainly if it's lifting drain covers, um, it's bringing with it everything that was underneath, uh, that lurked beneath. Um, and if you were to walk, up, walk through the water and then drop down into one of those, one of those chambers, if you, if, if you ended up, there's obviously a chance of getting stuck in it. But even worse, if it was a big enough system, you could get flushed away down it and uh, with, with no chance at all, really, of coming back up out of there. And it'd be extremely hazardous for our crews to try and get you out of there as well. Um, I touched on briefly before where you get things like uh, you can't see what's under the water or you get fast rushing water. You might have things like wire fences and things. The human body is very good at getting pressed up against things like that. Um, and although those fences will let lots of water passing through at very high speeds, what it won't do is allow, allow a person to get away from it once the water's pushing you against it. And it's a bit unforgiving really. So you can become entangled, you can become cut. <coughs> just generally stuck and trapped. We call those uh, those sort of um, hazard strainers. Uh, something else that's, um, that, that, that's worth mentioning is just that um, one of the hazards of, of flood water, particularly if it's flowing, is that people generally think, oh, it's only shallow here. This won't be a problem. I could cross here. Well, the nature of water is such that if it's flowing, that um, where, it, where it's passing through a, a narrower space or a tighter space or it's gone shallower, very often that means that's where it's flowing the fastest um, and it can really, you know, the weight of water that's, go that's going that quickly can really take you with it. OK, and then, of course, other people feel obliged to come and help you. And guess what? They can get swept away as well. And the more people that try and help, the more um, of our firefighters and, um, and technicians we have to then put in place to try and to try and get you out. It's not safe for them just because they've got equipment that makes it safer. Uh, it's extremely hazardous even for us. Uh, so that's just a few things. I mean, you can also have things like, um, especially if, if drain covers lift and things, you can have things like hypodermic syringes come out, needles, all that sort of thing. Basically, a, a whole range of nasties. You do get people wanting to walk through. You do get people coming to have a look from all over the place. I was there when, um, during the great flood of Hereford in whatever year it might be, you know, and they'll go and they'll, they'll take videos and all the rest of it. It's almost like a form of tourism for some people. Um, so we're particularly wary of, of that, really. And, and of course, those people are, are even less familiar with the area. And it's not a playground. I mean, we very often see people out on inflatable boats in dinghies, kayaks, all sorts of things going up and down high streets just because of the novelty of it. 
But again, you know, there are those hazards underneath. And yes, they are paddling around pretty much in sewage or chemical waste or whatever, wherever that water's been. Okay, so without laboring that point anymore, Pete, can we move on, please? Driving. So it, it never fails to surprise me just how many people are prepared to uh, write off their, their traveling ability for a month or however long it may be for the sake of getting home half an hour earlier or whatever it may be. If a road is closed, we implore you and, and, and your communities, please don't drive into it. You know, you just can't tell how deep it is. You can't tell from the edge of the road, especially at night time as well, just how fast it's flowing or where it's going to take you to, because this is very often not following the usual path that you follow. Otherwise, it'd be in the rivers rather than on the road. Um, and people can avoid damage to and loss of their vehicles. But, you know, we go to so many of these. It's just so incredibly common and people end up on the top of their cars. And then if the floodwaters continue to rise, and the water continues to come through faster, it can move the cars with it and they can get washed away with people on top of them. Very unstable, very dangerous. Um, and again, extremely dangerous for us to come and try and rescue people from as well, uh, because it's not a stable working platform for us to actually help you from. Um, but we will always have a go. Um, barrel waves. Many of you might have heard that actually the way to make sure your car engine doesn't um, go bang if you drive through water is to create a bow wave so start going through it and then keep the speed up and if anything slightly speed up to create a bow wave keep the water out the engine if you're, if you're doing that again it's a very very high risk technique i don't recommend it but where's that bow wave going it could well be going into somebody else's house so where where they might have just kept the water out of their building with a door guard a bow wave might just be enough just to send it over the top um so it's not considerate either really um I think we can move on, Pete, please. Yeah, just to emphasise that point again, really. It's, it's just not worth it. And, and we really beg you to, to not do that. So salvage and restoration, once the flooding's been. Um, again, think about your expectations, um, or at least your, your community's expectations um, on the Fire and Rescue Service. Again, our priority will always be life risk. And there may well still be people trapped or there may well be people driving into flood water and so on. Um, you know, even once most of the flood water has subsided, because it doesn't just drop from everywhere at the same time. In fact, it tends to, in my experience, move around from place to place. So one place is recovering from it just as the other is getting the next load of it. Um, so, um, and of course, we will follow that around as people need us to. If we are available and you'd like us to pump out something because it's hazardous or you or you need our help, we can do that. But we just have to be wary of where exactly we're we pumping it to. Where are we taking all that water from and where are we actually putting it to? Because if the water table is high everywhere, are we going to make it worse for somebody else by moving all that water? Um, so, again, we ask your, your communities and you in your parish councils to actually encourage community resilience. <laughs> There are some, some risks to this, um, such as people's uh, manual handling when they're moving things around, um, DIY injuries in, in sort of DIY flood defences and things and utilities. If people have got their own petrol pumps to pump out their own properties, not a bad idea, but please don't use them in enclosed spaces or indoors because the exhaust from those petrol pumps will fill your atmosphere with carbon monoxide, um, which is a highly toxic gas and doesn't take long to finish people off. Um, so just things to bear in mind, whilst we're asking for resilience, there are hazards to that as well. So it needs to be done with a degree of care. Um, I'll just actually just look at the example there as well. And there's one of, the, one of the parish councils there, Peterstow residents there, uh, example really of comms that they've, they've done and uh, what, what they provide and, and how their community, um, you know, has enhanced resilience there, talking about water pumps that are available, flood sacks, um, even stuff for winter weather as well. So that's just an example of something they're doing. And then afterwards, if you know, if you saw what problems the flooding brought you last time or this time, um, don't, you know, it's a, it's a safe bet to think it might come again one day. And if it does, that's the time to think about uh, before that is, is the time to think about how to design out uh, the problems you had last time or build in defences which prevent it from happening again. Okay, Pete. And thank you very much for your time.
Thanks, Gareth. Uh, really useful as always. Uh, I don't think I've picked up any questions in the chat. Please, Pete, please correct me if I missed anything. No, um, I'll invite any questions and if anyone has anything they would like to ask or raise with Gareth. Pastor Jimman. Thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Gareth, for that presentation. I mean, first, uh, a comment and that is just how brilliantly our um, small fire services work, those that are in the villages and so on, and certainly one down here. I mean, we, we're, they're just so important and so useful. And during the flooding, they, they put in a well beyond uh, anybody's expectation in terms of work. So just a comment of praise really to your organisation in that regard. Um, second comment was that one of the problems with the current flooding and it comments be made about how it's flash flooding and it's occurring in strange places and odd places is that uh, this is catching out livestock and we're seeing situations where people quite innocently and properly have put animals on particular fields that nobody ever knew would flood and this is becoming you know is, is clearly quite a, an interesting problem in terms of how you actually get people warned of this because they're, they're not somewhere that they expect those where they expect it they've got used to it and have got plans and so on and it's added to by the fact that so much farming these days is not just the farmer farming the land around the farm but also having livestock at a diff distant point which you might visit on a relatively infrequent basis so it, it's something which i think we need to flag up to the farming community to think in terms of as a particular change and a particular challenge yeah okay uh, well, well first off thanks ever so much for your for your praise of our crews you know they, they'd love to know that yeah which which are your local crews um, U.S. Harold is my local one that I've worked very closely with and spent many a happy soggy hour or six um, trying to rescue homes, people and otherwise. Peter Church obviously is also because they back up brilliantly. They work together fantastically well. But I mean, the retained services are just they're so important. And I just wanted to make up that point. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll definitely pass on those comments to, to John Chance and to Kevin Giles. They'll both appreciate that a great deal. And, and you're right, they really enjoy it getting out and about and helping as well. Um, in relation to comment about the farming community, yes, I mean, I just I, I can't agree with you more, really. Uh, it's not to say that we won't assist in those circumstances. We definitely will. It's just as I've tried to put across earlier on, we have to prioritise uh, where our resources go. So it might be that livestock will be some way down the list, but it's still savable life. Um, and there's still a humanitarian aspect to it, you know, suffering and all that sort of thing. So we'll, we won't not come. It's just that it may be somewhere down the list. So, yeah, your, your, your thoughts on how to get that across to farmers is, um, is a good one. Thank you. I'm sure we'd all echo, uh, you know, that appreciation and gratitude for the work of uh, the Fire and Rescue Service. The, the second point regarding the, uh, the farmers, I believe we're going to explore a little further now with uh, Steve's in. Sorry, Chair. Uh, um, Before I move on to that, oh, go on, Pete, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Nigel Moore has got his hand raised, Chair. Just very, do, briefly, um, very briefly, just to say, um, a, a um, the Chairman of Lambourne Parish Council would like to thank you for your boat's arrival and his rescue. Um, and certainly a resident of uh, Langaran had the benefit of that uh, a couple of winters ago. Um, it's really just coming back to roads and flash flooding causes deep water in roads. Um, but we're told that we can't put out signs saying road closed um, because it's not legal. Um, is that true? And if possible, can we then put up uh, local uh, warning signs to people, do not drive through here. Okay, Th thank you, Nigel. That's, uh, and again, thank you for your, your first comments as well. It's much appreciated. Um, regards to road closures, I know that certainly uh, we have limited ability to close roads under certain conditions. Um, so flooding would be, would be one of those because it's an emergency. 
Um, as for the bigger picture with that, I'm going to have to defer to Ross for that one. Yeah, it, it's a great point and one I'll take back to the TCG for consideration in the broader planning than that. So um, this is all about preparation and improving uh, the situation next time round. And of course, the quicker those closure signs can be put out, um, the more beneficial it is to prevent people from getting into those difficulties which we've covered off before. So Balfour BT will be deployed to um, put in place those road closures. Um, but we all have to recognise the limitation of the resources and therefore the ability to uh, quite often respond to that. Oh. Sorry, it's me responding to the emergency there. Um, respond to that as effectively as, as we possibly can. So um, I don't know whether um, Pete or Steve from a council point of view would have anything they would wish to add, but I certainly would want to explore that further. If we could identify uh, a means of getting those uh, signs out uh, more quickly, uh, that's something that we absolutely must and, and should do. I think from my understanding from the council's point of view, it's the legal aspect of the putting a sign out if it were uh, incorrectly cited and there was a civil liability claim on the back of it. I think that's one of the things that we consider, but also I'm not quite sure um, uh, where within the law it allows a private individual to actually close a road. And I'm sure there's uh, it, it's really quite difficult. I mean, it may be something we do take to TCG and establish those hot spots that perhaps um, th there is a way or through the parish council approaching BBLP to see if some drop board signage could be made available. But again, it, it's the legal side of it. We just need to make sure um, because I think in today's society, you know, people do claim and some of these claims can be fairly substantial. And I'm sure the parish council or individuals wouldn't want to be in the end of uh, a hefty legal bill. So it's just making sure we get those legal signs um, signed off by those. And it is frustrating because people want to do the right thing. And I think we fully understand that. Uh, Councillor Stark, good evening. Uh, would you like to try again, please? Yes, I, I dropped out because I've got a terrible connection. Um, my main concern with the flooding in my ward in Ross West was driver behaviour, which was disgraceful, totally disgraceful. Um, going back to Steve's point, I had to take a road closure sign from Brookend, which wasn't really being effective because people were working in Brookend at the moment and you could clearly see it was flooded to move it to Grey Tree Road because drivers were trying to drive through a dale of about eight feet of water, particularly with four by fours. And I think the contra argument to what you've just said, Steve, if we don't have a road closure, a driver drives into deep water, even if it's their own fault, and they either get injured or lose their lives, I think we'll have an even bigger liability in our hands as a county council because the uh, road closure sign was missing. So I agree with the comments from Nigel Moore. It's often the local councillor who's out at the scene at the time, as I was, during the flooding as it happened, who can contact the police and organise some of the emergency road closures that are required. You really do need to look at this coordination because I do think there's a gap here. And I felt we and Ross at times were just left to our own devices. And I was rushing around having to contact the police, having to tell them about particularly Grey Tree Road. I was worried about flooding going up the hill to two of the other properties in Cow Place. And basically, we do need to coordinate things better. We do need to have some sort of rules that we can actually, on local initiative, close roads. Because the drivers... We're still ignoring it after we did it, but at least there were fewer trying to get through because without some sort of um, local initiative there, the, and I'm, I'm on the fire thought as well, my poor service will be rushing around, spending most of their time rescuing drivers who should know better while my residents are getting flooded out. So, I mean, this is a big issue, and I think it's something that the, the TCG needs to look at because, frankly, it didn't work very well in 2020 at all. Yeah, it's an enormous issue. I'll absolutely take it back for us to work through. Um, one of the reasons for this meeting tonight is about empowering communities to 
do as much as they can to support each other and help each other in these circumstances in the recognition that the individual resources within each of our agency are limited and will be stretched in these circumstances. So if we can overcome those barriers which may be in the way, which are currently preventing us from um, enacting that, um, we can absolutely explore that. We, we are very keen to promote local flood wardens to help the, sort of the warning and informing process in and around properties. So it could well be that we'll explore uh, a similar network of people that could deploy in those circumstances. Right. I can't guarantee there'll be a positive outcome because there'll be um, other considerations that will need to be given to it. But I think it's absolutely right that we explore it and revisit it. I, I think we we need to draw in these local resources and give them some sort of role that they're expected to take on when we get the sort of flooding we got in February 2020. I found myself completely having to use my own initiative as county councillor. To try, and some of my town councillors were doing exactly the same. And, and there was at least one who was a farmer who was moving rocks around and sandbags around to try and help uh, residents that were um, at risk of flooding. So perhaps you need to look at the roles that we all play here and, and maybe try and design some specific roles and responsibilities that can be legitimised so that we can go down and play our parts because we are often the ones on the ground, remember, first, when, when the flooding is actually happening. Yeah, I agree. That's a really positive suggestion. And we'll Can I... take that uh, away and work that up through um, through the planning for this. Thank you. Can I just come in on this? Because last time we ended up, I did get permission to put out the signs, um, mainly because nobody could get through the floods in order to put the signs <laughs> out. So um, <laughs> it was really a case of a, a, you know, a, a win the situation by the nature of the problem. But can I put a second plea in on this? And that there's two sorts of sign. One is which is warning there's a flood and there's a second the road closed. Actually having the warning there's a flood doesn't close the road and therefore it might be a legal way you could get around this. And putting out beware flood ahead can be very good closing a road I appreciate and we were told the same at the time and obviously the insurance issue arose at that point the other really important point is taking the signs down because we ended up having near accidents and more near accidents because of the failure to take the signs down when the waters had gone away because the these signs were then standing in the road uh, that's, that have been put up legitimately not the ones we'd done the ones that were legitimately put up by the relevant agency and uh, that seemed to me to become a almost a bigger problem than not having the, the sign there in the first place. So I just, when you're thinking about it, please think of both putting them up and taking them down. Right. Chair, can I invite uh, Rachel Rice to come on, please? Sorry, Rachel, you're on mute. Yeah, I'll just introduce myself. So I'm, I work for Bath and Beauty um, and obviously the conversation we're having is around um, official road closure. So I just thought I'd just add into the conversation. Um, absolutely everything is correct that's been said about the legal process. So it is a legal process in order to close the road that we have to go through. Um, there are circumstances, as Councillor Jim has um, indicated, where we can provide signage if it's right to do so, but it's about making sure that information is then passed back because we have a legal requirement in, all, in, um, in order to um, do a, a notice and to make sure it's on the one network system. So it's about making sure that's in place as well. So there are constraints, but there are ways that we can work around that. And as Councillor Jinnah said, a, a real positive option that we can look at is the provision of the flood warning signs because quite rightly they're not you know they don't have to go through that same legal process as well so you know we can issue those out to named individuals with very clear instructions as to when they should be put out and when they shouldn't be put out and obviously we don't want any individuals putting themselves in danger as well so we need to be careful about that as well you know if if they've got signage that they don't feel beholden to put it out if it's going to put themselves in danger that you know we wouldn't want that either Great, thank you. That sounds really positive and we will certainly progress that and uh, sounds as if that's very achievable. Um, any other questions before I move to Steve, our final presentation for this evening? OK, thank you. Over to you then, please, Steve.
Steve, you're on mute. There we go. I thought I should have learned by now, but uh, yeah, apologies. So yeah, Steve Hodges, Herefordshire Council, and yeah, I'm the lead officer on flood risk management. So yeah, just put a few slides together. So Pete, if you could move me on. Yeah, so firstly, I was just going to talk about communication channels. And I guess what I would say is, you know, the first port of call, you know, should um, should be the the council's flood web pages. They are regularly, you know, updated. So herefordshire.gov.uk slash floods. And we've tried to structure the information on there um, in terms of you know, preparation, reporting of a flood after a flood. Um, and what we what we will try to do is, you know, just keep that information, you know, up to date um, as and when we receive information from from government, from other departments. Um, and so, yeah, like I say, that that would be the that would be the uh, the best source of information. If you go on to the next slide, Pete. Yeah, and in terms of our website, um, depending depending on you know the nature of the flooding. So if flooding is expected or experienced, then there would be a more prominent um, banner um, on the council's uh, website homepage. Um, so that, like I say, that that that's one of the first things you'd see when you click onto the website, and then you know clicking on that banner, you know will will then link to uh, you know some more more prominent and more specific information. And so I've just given an example there of um, the type of information that would have been available around the February 2020 floods. So. The flood, the flooding part of the website almost takes uh, almost like a blog type approach, so that you know is is updated in you know real time in terms of road closures and alerts that we receive. Okay, Pete, next slide. Yeah, so within our web pages, uh, we've tried to include contact details for the different. Um, different agencies that you might want to get in, in touch with, but I guess the, the main message is, you know, call 999 if there's a risk to, to people or property. Um, I've included the, the the number for the the BBLP call centre. You know, call 01432 26 1800 if there's deep water on the road or if there's fast flowing water that's causing damage to the road or to structures. Um, you will also, or you may also notice that on our website that whilst there is functionality, you know, for people to uh, report flooding, um, it's important to note that this will not trigger an emergency response. So in an emergency situation, you know, do phone it up. But the reporting flooding is more just in terms of just adding to our knowledge base, really, just in, in terms of understanding what has happened and where. Um, Pete, if next. Next slide. Yeah, so this has already been touched upon already, but the council, you know, is a category one responder and, you know, we've got plans in place in order to respond to emergencies and to help control and reduce their impact. And, you know, I think as Gareth and others have, have mentioned, you know, we, along with Balfour BT, you know, we provide assistance during flooding incident and when uh, when the flood risk is high, but as with other agencies, resources are limited and do have to be be prioritised. Um, so, Pete, next slide. So, I guess with this in mind, we do we do um, try and encourage uh, communities to you know help identify some of those local hazards and to make plans to assist emergency services and other responding agencies. So. Um, in order to to help communities develop their own plans, uh, the resilience team have, have have put together some guidance and templates. Um, it's not th these plans aren't intended just to cover flooding. Um, it, it may be industrial fires or other extreme weather, such as you know snowfall or winter events. Um, and 
by all means, you know, do get in touch with with Pete and Ian and others in the team to find out more about, you know, what can be done to help your community to to develop its own plans. Uh, Pete, next slide. I guess it's important to reference the reference um, as as well as uh, the response, but also the role that we play in in recovery. So after the the February 2020 um, floods, um, through the Talk Community Initiative, we we coordinated council staff and other and, and staff from other agencies going out to some of these areas that were impacted by flooding, trying to provide advice helping them to complete applications for grants and in some cases helping directly in, in the cleanup. Um, again, the type of information that, that may be pertinent, you know, during the recovery phase, it is on our website. And like I say, every flood event we have is different in terms of the, the steer we get from government and the help available. So, you know, the, the very latest information in terms of, you know, what to do after a flood and what financial help is available will be on our on our web pages at herefordshire.gov.uk uh, slash floods. Okay, Pete. Um, I thought it might just be pertinent just to um, to say a little bit more about uh, property flood resilience or, or, or PFR. I know Gareth has you know touched on this you know already in in his uh, in his presentation, but basically there's two parts to PFR. Um, there's resistance measures, and I've tried to you know include a few photos there just to give some examples of you know what some of these resistance you know measures are. Um, so there's things like uh, flood barriers, flood doors, flood gates, um, the self-closing air bricks. There's air vents, uh, sump pumps, uh, portable pumps. Uh, non-return valves, examples of tanking, um, silicon sealing, repointing and waterproof spray. So these are all things that aim to try and reduce the amount of water that you know comes into buildings, hoping to to reduce the damage that's caused internally. But alongside you know resistance, it's not always possible to keep the water out. So there are you know recoverability measures. Um, that people can take as well, so such as you know raising electricity sockets, um, utility meters, um, the use of solid flooring, um, and perhaps waterproof uh, kitchen fittings. So these are all things that you know help allow the clean up and repair process to you know to happen a bit more quickly and and hopefully allow people to recover that bit that bit bit quicker. Um, Pete, next slide. And Following the, the February 2020 floods, um, people who were unfortunate enough to have flooded internally are able to potentially access up to £5,000 um, of funding. Um, this is a scheme that we're administering on behalf of DEFRA, and it will allow people to have a survey carried out of their property which will identify the you know some of the, the measures that may be required and you know contribute towards some of the cost of these measures. Um, on the basis of some of the feedback we received and the difficulty some people have had in in getting surveyors, we've now put arrangements in place so that you know if people you know do want to to take part but haven't been able to um, organise the survey, then you know just get in touch, encourage them to get in touch with us, and you know we can get that survey organised. Um, but again, there's there's more information on our website. It's on the PFR part of our website, um, and like I say, that that's up to date with uh, you know the latest information we have on that. But like I say, if you know if people have been flooded and you know they're thinking about it, then to encourage them to get in touch with us. Um, next next slide, please, Pete. Yeah, so I was I was really just going to end my presentation with just a few slides, um, you know, on this. Um, and basically, if if you have a ditch or a water course either on or adjacent to your property, then you're probably responsible under common law for its maintenance. And so, as such, you're a riparian owner. Um, 
the maintenance of uh, you know the majority of you know, the ditches that run alongside the roadside you know are the the responsibility of the the adjacent um, landowner and I guess what in essence we you know what does this mean it that your basic responsibility as a riparian owner is to ensure the proper flow of water by preventing any obstructions um, next slide Pete so we've reviewed our internal uh, processes and have produced some step-by-step -step, um, guidelines that can be used by parish councils, ward members, you know, Balfour Beatty communities to, to ensure a more focused response uh, to the to good maintenance of drainage, you know, throughout the county. You know, we, we've really seen the impact of, you know, the significant, uh, you know, flooding in recent years. And, you know, it's, it is important for us to encourage all riparian owners to take, you know, take that responsibility. And, you know, whilst the council, you know, you know, does have powers to carry out enforcement actions, um, um, enforcement action from, you know, water running from land onto the highway and causing a nuisance, you know, in the, in the vast majority of cases, you know, we will be, you know, trying to work together with people really and, you know, trying to sort things out that way. But like I say, we do, we do have those powers. Um, the, the next slide, please, Pete, last one. And yeah, and I guess really it's just in, in, in terms of this, you know, what can you do if you think there's an issue then, you know, if you know the landowner and you have a relationship, then, you know, do encourage them to take responsibility. Um, you can signpost you know, some relevant information for them um, through our, through the council flood web pages, you know, there's links there to the, the very latest and recently updated guidance leaflets. And you know, do spread that awareness, you know, within your own communities. But if, but if you need to, you know, please do, you know, report the issues. And you can either do that, you know, through phoning 01432261800, or or you can report it through the council website. Um, okay, I think that's my last slide. Um, thank you. Thanks, Steve. I have picked up on one question in the chat, and that's regarding the um, whether there's uncertainty about numbers of properties that get affected by flooding in the county. Is that something you're able to comment on? Um, I think I think what you know what we've seen is you know the you know the scale of the flooding that we, that we saw in October 2019 and, and 2020 was on a far greater scale than, you know, what we've seen before. You know, I joined the council back in 2007 um, and, you know, we saw, um, you know, the, fl the floods during the summer then, you know, when, you know, around two to 300 properties flooded. And I think this time around it was, you know, several hundred properties. Um, you know, so I think it's fair to say you know, we've seen an awful lot of properties flooded this time round, or or nearly flooded this time round that you know weren't aware. So I'm not I'm not sure that um, in terms of the point that we don't know how many properties are affected by flooding. We can only you know act on you know those who choose to report the flooding to us. Um, you know we you know whilst we we believe you know several hundred properties you know were flooded that number's probably underreported. You know, there's probably more. You know, a number of people will choose for whatever reason not to tell us. But yeah, the the scale of the flooding this time round was, you know, very significant. Thanks, Steve. I think I've just seen a hand raised by Councillor Jinman. Yep, th thanks very much. Um, Every time we get a warning that looks as though it's going to head for flooding, my phone seems to ring with somebody saying, where do we get our sandbags from? Um, the answer to that is invariably now not provided, uh, followed by immediately afterwards, um, well, where do we get what we need then? And it it's always a problem, Steve, as you know, that. <laughs> Not not everybody has a computer. Not everybody has a website access. Not everybody. Get, is there a way we could actually get some sort of leafleting on this? Um, and could we assist the parish councils in that regard? Because getting the message out there that actually you as a householder have got a responsibility for your own house is quite a tough one on occasions for 
certainly when we got um, a lot of the houses that were flooded on that exceptional time once before, poor person only moved in the house on the, on the Friday and it flooded on the Saturday and the Sunday. You know, they haven't got time to even think about it and they needed uh, sandbags. And fairness, we got some then and I accept that. But the principle seems to have gone that centrally ring up, get sandbags. It's now, and also I think there's a big question how good sandbags actually are very often. But, uh, you know, a bit of a, a bit more perhaps um, assistance in a paper form that we could deliver to houses and really make them understand what their responsibilities are and what they can get and where they get it from. Because again, the website talks about it, but it doesn't say, you know, these are the sort, these are the particular bits of stuff that work. Be a bit more practical. No, that's, you know, that's a you know, fair point. And I know, you know, previously, you know, we have, you know, produced, you know, these these types of, you know, leaflets, documents, whatever. I guess the danger with some of these printed leaflets is almost as soon as you print them, you know, something's changed or they become out of date. But I know there's a piece of work planned, you know, internally as well, just looking at, you know, some of these alternatives, you know, to sandbags and, you know, you know, what are, you know, what are the better alternatives, you know, that are out there. So, let 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 me take let me take that away and you know discuss with you know, my colleagues in um, the the comms team and you know let's you know see see what's possible and you know whether it's you know something through the TCG or you know something as a council but yeah we can certainly take that away. Um, Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, and I'd suggest and again uh, the the timing of this is now is the time that we want to be encouraging people to make their own plans and preparations rather than waiting for. Uh, the weather to to create that that risk and threat really so uh, thank you and uh, thanks Steve for, for taking that away uh, I think another hand's just gone up but I didn't catch who and I can't uh, see. Councillor Stark's been waiting uh, the longest at this time. Please do go ahead. Uh, thank you uh, my question is addressed to Jason if he's still there um, the environmental agency at the moment use use a, a categorised system of flood risk zones assessments. One, two and three, I think, uh, are, are the ones that are used at the moment. I've got a couple of questions. One, Jason, is the Environmental Agency going to review those, those um, um, flood risk zone um, uh, assessments in the light of the severe flooding that we've had? And given that we're likely to have more of that uh, type of event in the future and secondly from a planning point of view how how much are the environmental agency involved in trying to in trying to avoid more house house development on zones that are really going to be flooded in the future so that's two questions one is on the the the, the actual categorization you make at the moment where you're going to review that and the second is how involved are you in trying to avoid some of the planning decisions that are taken where we end up with housing being built on on, on flood zones the second question is probably the easier one to answer um which is that we'd always recommend and always comment on planning um applications where we're allowed and where we're consulted uh, that housing is not built on floodplains um we don't have the ultimate veto on housing developments unfortunately um so we would always recommend that housing isn't built on floodplains obviously because we're just creating ourselves a problem down the line if we're doing that so yeah we always recommend that housing is not built on floodplains and, and obviously if housing is built on floodplains then we would advise of the impacts that they're likely to see um in terms of the mapping it's a question for probably our partnership strategic overview team. I know that name doesn't really mean anything to you, but they would be the ones that would look at that modeling. The only thing I can comment on is that the, in terms of talking about a return period. So we used to say things like it's each zone used to be broken into like a one in 10, a one in a hundred and one in a thousand. And we stopped talking about those and we started talking about them in terms of risk. Uh, in terms of low risk, medium risk and high risk. Um, 
and yeah, I guess that it does make sense exactly what you're saying that with climate change um, and the more extremes of weather that we're seeing that something may well have to be done about those risk areas in the future. I can't answer that question directly though, but if you want to drop me on an email or if you want to get me your email address somehow, I can definitely get you a definite answer. Uh, Jason, I can pass you uh, the councillor's email address. Yeah, sure, that'd be great, because that, that's a really interesting point, actually. It's um, it's something that we'll definitely have to consider going forward. So, yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. And I believe we have another hand. I'm struggling because I'm not on a uh, desktop setup, so uh, please forgive me for that. Pete, could you help me out again? Uh, yes, certainly. Councillor Swingerhorst, you're next, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, a couple, couple of things. Um, one for Jason and a couple of things for, for Stephen. So, um, Jason, while we're on the subject of um, risk assessment of land use um, for development, it's always struck me as being very odd that we, 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 we have a risk assessment, so, you know, one in 100 plus 40 percent for a development uh, runoff rate, so on, so, but we don't risk assess um, uh, agricultural land use which which uh, can can have a enormous impact on a catchment if it's a, a steep catchment um, and th and there isn't as it were an equivalent one in a hundred plus bulk, you know formula for that um, do, do, do you think that's something that we should be thinking about um, I'm not sure really I mean I, I used to be an environment officer and the good agricultural guidelines and the good agricultural practice guide should really take care of that in its own right. And there is, you know, a whole host of uh, environmental legislation that looks after runoff from land and therefore hopefully looks after that risk being being created. Um, so if you've got specific concerns about specific fields, then it's just one of those you're going to have to report to us. It's, it's, it is, yeah, it is I mean, a great it's kind point. Of a wider problem than specific fields. Uh, that that you know that's it's not yeah. a specific yeah. there are specific fields but it's but it's a more general um, issue of change of land use from um, you know say pasture into maize uh, that, that's yeah. likely to have to that's increase the runoff um, and and uh, probably more than it would if you built three houses you know I mean that, but we assess we risk assess building three houses but we don't risk assess forty acres of pasture going to maize um, and that just struck me as strange um, anyway so for Steve. Um, one thing that I find that 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 the kind of um, really frustrating thing is debris that gets stuck on road grids. So when we're talking about preparedness, that might be something to kind of highlight. So you know, if you know there's a storm coming, OE parish council, lengthsman, whoever, you know, make sure that the road grids aren't blocked up with twigs and leaves and stuff, uh, because that, that instantly the water then duck can't get down. Uh, the drainage, even though the drainage might be able to handle it. Um, I don't know if there's any kind of technical solution for that or or some other way that we might approach that, but it's, it always struck me as it would be good practice to make sure that the grids are clear um, in, in any known uh, sort of floody areas. Um, and the other thing is on uh, repair and responsibility. Well, uh, I've got a case uh, and, and, and would appreciate maybe we talk about this more, but where there's actually a triple problem, which is a landowner and drain onto the road and another landowner and, and nobody's doing anything because unless one person does it nothing can happen uh, and the net result is that someone's being flooded um so do, do we have a um a system in place for for multiple riparian responsibilities okay um so so i think probably the, the short answer to the second one is we can probably have a conversation um you know around that to understand the the specifics um but yeah we you know we, we we've got people you know within within the organizations you know the good understanding so yeah happy to have that conversation and see if we can move try and move okay. that forward email um, yeah do you know do do share yeah do, do share share the details and yeah it's a fair point in terms of um you know making sure stuff's clear i know um it, the, you know the gangs are you know out and about you know when when these you know warnings you know are received and you know being as proactive as they can but I guess yes it's making sure that you know we are aware and you know if there are you know particular you know hot spots or whatever then I guess it's just making you know making us aware really um and and making sure those resources are in you know the right places but um 
yeah, you're right. Yeah, I think there are technological solutions out there, you know, in terms of how they're monitored. But yeah, that's a good point. We may be able to explore that as well as part. A lot of this is about um, sort of empowering the community to protect themselves, really. So we discussed earlier about the warning and informing role of community wardens and whether we could extend that to the distribution of the warning signs on the road. It might be that we could explore some uh, community action to mitigate against that in recognition of the, the size of the county and the number of um, areas to, to monitor. So um, in addition to Steve uh, taking that away, we could discuss that as a, as a TCG as part of the, the planning too. So thank you. Um, Jenny Goins, next on the list, Chair. Thank you. Um, it was really in response to the point that uh, Councillor Ginman raised about asking for information that can be sent out to people. Um, just to say, here in Wellington, um, about six months after Flood Dennis, we actually did a dedicated newsletter on the subject of flooding, what had happened, how people could prepare themselves and we delivered that to every house in our parish and actually since um, I've been having meetings with um, River Lug Internal Drainage Board and also with Steve we've actually produced a leaflet to and that's gone out to every householder in the village that has riparian responsibilities and it's just pointing out to them what their responsibilities are where they can get information and so on so just as a parish council, it's just a demonstration of what you can do to get information to people. I'm blowing my own trumpet, really, aren't I? No, uh, that's that's really helpful and, and beneficial. Is that something that you'd be willing to share with uh, uh, our broader communities on here to to learn? Yeah, sure. Time? I mean, certainly the riparian um, leaflet, anybody could adapt it, and I'm quite happy if anybody wants it. Um, just ask for my email address and I can send them a copy of it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. No problem. OK, I think I'm at the end, Pete, of the questions and hands raised. Yeah, I think Councillor Swinglehurst is you as a legacy hand raised. Or have you a new question you'd like to ask? Oh, thank you. I think that's chair. I think we're, uh, we're at the end now. Great. Well, well, thank you all. I, I apologise that we've run over time, but it, it's great that we've had such uh, you know great invested um, and considered contributions for everybody. So I hope that you forgive us for running over by half an hour. Uh, my appeal is that you, uh, you you take this away and, and consider with your local communities about building resilience and um, promoting preparations for uh, the inevitable flooding that, that will come, unfortunately. Um, and just finally from me, uh, my thanks really, thanks to uh, to Jason and to Gareth and to Steve for, for their presentations this evening. Uh, and a really sincere thanks to Pete from Herefordshire Council for pulling it all together, administrating and facilitating uh, this evening's uh, event. Uh, so I'll finish up there and let you enjoy the remainder of uh, Herefordshire sunshine this evening. Uh, thank you all. Uh, take care and see you again soon. Thank you very much indeed. Cheers. Good night, everybody. Thanks all. Mm.